Welcome, everyone. I am thrilled to be part of the discussion today. Um, the topic for today is dismantling structural racism and injustice here in the United States. Um, I'm Theo Sitter. I'm a senior fellow at the Alliance for Peacebuilding. Um, and, you know, I'm just excited about the incredible lineup of speakers that we have for you today. Um, and, and I'm excited for all of our participants who are joining us. I think at last check, we had at least 139 people who are registered for the event today. Uh, and um, and at, at this point, I'm seeing at least fifth, you know, a little over 50 people who are in the participants list, and I'm sure more people will join us. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so welcome to the event. If you are planning to tweet while you are on this event, please do use the hashtag uh, Peace4US um, as you're tweeting or sending this out through other social media uh, uh, platforms. So the panel today is the second event in our spring series, speaker series, on preventing and reducing conflict and instability in the United States, shaping what comes next. Um, so we're talking throughout the spring and, you know, looks like more likely into the summer, we're going to be talking with leaders, policy experts, donors, uh, connecting the Alliance for Peacebuilding Network with other networks that are doing this incredible work uh, to build justice and to build peace uh, right here in our own country. Um, as we get into this conversation and as we kind of introduce the speakers, I do want to acknowledge and name that we're doing this event today, uh, a day after the verdict, the big verdict yesterday in the Derek Chauvin uh, trial. So Derek Chauvin was found guilty by a court of law. Um, while this particular moment uh, is cause for celebration, I think to me, it certainly is a reminder that we have so much more work to do to transform the systems and the structures that have perpetuated racism in the United States, really, I mean, since, since the beginning, since its founding as a country. And, you know, my hope for our community uh, is that the, and particularly the peace building community, is that we can have an honest grappling with what it means to dismantle structural and systemic racism in the United States. Um, and I believe that this, that, that honest grappling is what will move us towards building a more holistic and just society right here at home. What Dr. King, of course, called um, creating the beloved community. Um, so on to our speakers today. The, the first person that I wanted to introduce is, uh, is Kayla Williams. Uh, after Kayla gives her remarks, um, I, we're going to turn things over to Auntie Penty Cannon, who's actually uh, agreed to moderate the panel for us today. Um, and, and Auntie can do a, a, a larger introduction of the other panelists. So Kayla Williams, I'm really excited, is here joining us. She's the Deputy Chief of Staff for Representative Barbara Lee of California. Uh, Representative Lee is the, is the sponsor, along with her Senate uh, counterpart, uh, Senator Cory Booker, uh, of a resolution calling for the establishment of a commission on truth, racial healing, and transformation. And, uh, and Kayla is really here to talk about that particular re resolution and Representative uh, Lee's kind of vision behind it. So with that, Kayla, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Theo, and thank you, Alliance for Peace Building, for having me here today. Um, like Theo said, I am Congresswoman Barbara Leach, Deputy Chief of Staff, and I've been working with her on our Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation resolution that she introduced last year after the murder of George Floyd. I think her vision behind introducing this particular res resolution came after four years of working really closely with Dr. Gail Christopher, who is somewhat the godmother of this truth, racial healing and transformation idea. Um, 
what she is really focused on and what Congresswoman Lee is really focused on is having a real dialogue, a truthful dialogue about the impacts that policies have had um, and have harmed, dis harmed disproportionately communities of color specifically about educating the public about the nature of the policies and the institutions and how they've harmed communities of color. The resolution particularly talks about different instances in which the government has implemented policies that have impacted uh, communities of racial and ethnic minorities. What Congresswoman Lee is trying to do is to shift the dialogue to talk about root causes and to have real conversations about, about these particular issues. Right now, the um, resolution has 136 co-sponsors and we are pushing for even more. Um, and just the legacy of Congresswoman Lee's position on race and equity, she has been pushing and has been an advocate for it since she entered Congress in 1998. One of the first bills that she co-sponsored as a freshman member was, um, as we know it now, HR 40, which is a commission to study um, reparations for African-Americans. Um, recently that was passed out of Judiciary Committee and is on its way to the floor. And Congresswoman Lee has been very supportive of that. She believes that the TRHT commission is complementary to those efforts. And, is the beginning and the first step of having a real conversation about the harmful policies and impacts of structural, structural racism and systemic racism in our institutions. Um, so that's the general gist uh, of the resolution. We are hoping that we can see a commission come into fruition in these next couple of years, but we have been fighting the good fight and Congresswoman Lee has been fighting the good fight for a very long time. Um, so that's the gist of the resolution. If you want to know more about it, feel free to reach out to our office and I think I'll switch it back over to Theo. Thank you, Sorry. actually. Yeah, Keila, I'm happy to pick up from here. And I think you know that uh, your predecessor, Shelley Mark, is really well known by Alliance for Peacebuilding as who was recognized for her role to receive the Melanie Greenberg Peace Builder Prize. And, and so we, we are in this alliance just great fans of the work you have done uh, at the Red Police Office and so proud of you and thank you for joining these efforts. Um, the spirit, Shelley, and now you have created among the nationwide alliance supporting this resolution is just incredible. Um, so thank you for that. My name is Antti Bendigan and um, I am a professor at the George Mason University Carter School. Um, but also at the USIP, uh, at the Carter School, I lead the Mary Hoke Center for Reconciliation. And uh, our dedication is to support those who are spearheading these changes and leading these processes. So stay behind. I recognize I'm not American, I'm white. There's so much I don't know and I need to learn. And by recognizing that, I just want to express my thankfulness of being in, in this space with you. I also continue a little bit about you know, what you said about the magnitude of um, yesterday. And um, so only one can hope that the United States has now reached uh, a turning point in, in this, in this uh, strive to have justice delivered for the victims of police brutality, especially the black, indigenous and people of color. Um, and looking into the comments from yesterday, President Biden said that this has happened too rare. And it's just a step in delivering basic accountability. Uh, but it can become a giant step also forward uh, in making march towards justice. We also heard about the brother of George Floyd speaking, saying, finally, we can breathe. And saying that how this connects, he connected to the, um, to the uh, killing uh, uh, of Emmett Till in 1955. Um, and how this march has to continue. It, it sometimes takes a lifetime, uh, but it has to continue. And we also heard from the president of NAACP, Derek Johnson saying how Floyd murder was the Selma moment of our time that then led to civil rights movement, but how many other policies have to come out of this situation. So what we're actually facing here is a true challenge where a democracy has been marginalizing and oppressing its people. And we're facing a situation that how do you help a democracy while it's having an element of functioning institutions, to be honest, to revisiting its future and transforming the society. And uh, when we look to the international experiences, we recognize that justice is very much uh, connected to inclusion 
fairness, but also transformation in terms of individual level, in terms of healing relationships and, and spearheading societal transformation. So, so that is one of the findings. Uh, and that's exactly why I think the TRHT bill is so thrilling and so insightful. And we're really happy to hear your thoughts. As Kayla said, uh, there was an incredible progress last week in terms of the HR40. And, but when you look into repairing the past harms, uh, you also have to work towards making sure that the harm doesn't come back in a new form. And that, it, therefore, repairing just past harms is not enough. There has to be a transformation and an effort, the dismantling of the systemic racism and injustice. And that's when healing where presence is part of that can truly happen. So with these thoughts, I also want to recognize the work of Dr. Gail Christopher uh, that Kayla referred to and this her very insightful leadership uh, on providing this framework. But we have a lot of other leaders on this call and our first speaker will be David Ragland. And, um, and David, you were among the first with uh, the current uh, Congresswoman Cori Bush to, to launch a first commission in the United States, the Truth Telling Project. And um, today you're discussing also about reparations as an act of reconciliation. So I'd like to turn it over to you and have you discussed based on your experience, what would be your advice for the United States on this topic at this hour? Sure, thank you so much for having me and such a pleasure to be on this call um, with, with so many wonderful people uh, and thinkers who are delving into this urgently important issue that um, we're filling, like we're filling it. We're filling it, we felt it last night uh, when, when we felt a measure of accountability. And we know that accountability is an aspect of, or, or headed toward the direction of justice. Um, and, but also at the same time, we saw a 15-year-old uh, Black girl, Micaiah Bryant, Bryant murdered um, right as we were getting um, the results of the Chauvin trial. And this also presses in on us the urgency of what we have to do um, and, and the importance of a truth process. And and a, a truth process that uh, reinforces healing and repair. And you know, for us, um, some of the things that, that really came to us and helped us to think about what we were doing uh, was um, Dr. Fania Davis's work, which she writes about in Race and Restorative Justice, where she talked about um, the need for healing justice and the justice that emerges from activism. And for us, our process in Ferguson was aligned with the Ferguson protest because the, the Ferguson protesters, um, who many of were a part of our process, and help to organize the process and bring families to tell their stories, they kept telling us that, you know, we need to get our, we need to hear our stories. We need internal healing. Like we need um, our truth to be listened to. And how do, how is our truth listened to in a moment and in a time where uh, police don't believe what they did was wrong. And, you know, th this also, to me, feels similar to, to the youth that I work with, who also were asked to reconcile with a police officer who had killed uh, one of the, the students who were in their, their own restorative justice group. His name was Kamani Gray. And when the students were asked to be in circle after so many, after almost over a year of being in circle and dealing with the trauma, um, what they said was every time we experience another um, murder of anyone by the police, we feel re-traumatized. 
and you know so we're we're left with with this question of how do how does the truth help us heal transform um and and right where does that lead us to and you know for us it it we believe that truth telling was the first step it was it was a moral accounting um as dr mani scott writes in her book can truth and reconciliation heal america's racial divide it's this first step this moral inventory what happened um and then you know that truth telling as similar to a transitional justice process you know along with truth seeking has to lead to repair and and our work led us to to really believe that um that reparations is the midpoint between truth and reconciliation particularly full reparations not not like like a check is important especially in this moment people who have been intergener intergenerationally traumatized and harmed and that trauma uh is continued to be built upon let me let me just explain this a bit more because i i've been reading uh the new biography of, about frederick Douglass, who was a lifelong abolitionist and his his entire life was about along with others ending slavery but as slavery formally ended there were all of these loopholes which we still are living through in where slavery is still allowed as an exclusion in u.s prisons where um we're still living with the slave patrol system and this fugitive slave laws that are enacted out and and institutionalized in american policing and so reparations has to look like a process in itself right and um after uh south africa um in 2000 right where th the conference on racism where people came together and we were looking at as an international community that as a response to gross crimes against human rights reparations had to be compensation it had to be healing mental material physical it had to be restitution returning of what was stolen it also had to be satisfaction and that's um, education culture building culture shifting memorial building um, and then guarantees of non-repeat transformation of laws so that these things wouldn't happen anymore so i think we're in a moment where because of the activism because of the the important work um by uh our congresswoman um and the important work of dr christopher um we also need to be thinking about repair that is about abolition as well thank you David, thank you. And thank you for that incredible vision of yours and, and the decades long commitment of spearheading this and being so insightful and willing to advise other, others considering similar commissions. You are just doing incredible transformational work uh, and impact throughout the country. When uh, Representative Barbara Lee introduced the resolution, it was really significant for her that uh, the different caucuses were standing with her and announcing the call for the resolution. And this is based on the understanding um, coming out of the work of Dr. Christopher that, that this country is facing uh, a, a challenge, which has been like Tio said from the foundation, the false hierarchy of human value. And you cannot deal that by one single group at a time. You have to address the root problem as a whole. And that's why the different groups have to stand together in the process. This was the principle. Um, 
our, our next speaker will be Kiki Carol. And uh, Kiki, if I am correct, you come from the Chinese and Rapaho uh, tribes, but you're also the chief, chief executive officer of the Southern United Southern and Eastern tribes. Um, and when you look into the indigenous struggle, of course, it's a, starting from a different point. Um, there is a lot of broken treaties. There is a lot of uh, false displacement. There is uh, acts of cultural genocide uh, and, and mass violence, killings. And, and, and so it's the pain and hurt that has similarities, but it has, has also differences. So we'd love to hear kind of your uh, insightful view on what this means, this moment uh, for the indigenous peoples of this country and what does it mean to be standing together? And if the TRC framework, in your view, can be part of this, uh, uh, looking forward, over to you. Yeah. Well, first of all, it absolutely can be, but let me just get started again. So my name is uh, Kitki Carroll, and I serve as the Executive Director of the United South and Eastern Tribes and the United South and Eastern Tribes Sovereignty Protection Fund. Uh, I am a citizen of the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribes, Oklahoma, as well as a citizen of the United States. Um, so basically, my charge today is to cover... Uh, centuries of history between the United States and tribal nations uh, in five minutes as part of my introductory remarks. So um, I am open to dialogue back and forth as the conversation proceeds. Uh, but for my five minutes, I do want to share some prepared remarks just to make sure that I hit all the points that I think are critically um, necessary for this conversation. Uh, but like others before me, I do want to uh, first, pause and acknowledge and celebrate yesterday. Celebrate yesterday's uh, guilty verdict. Uh, in this moment, uh, in this specific case, uh, justice was achieved. Uh, however, the fact that there was overwhelming, overwhelming concern uh, about whether justice was going to be achieved yesterday, uh, this in and of itself uh, should inform us that justice is not a guarantee in this country. Uh, and while there is absolute cause to celebrate. Uh, we must also remember that a single verdict is not the measure of achieving, achieving systemic cultural change uh, in this country, but it is a positive step uh, in the right direction. Um, unfortunately, uh, in a nation founded on self-evident truths that we are all created equal and in an allegiance pledge that requires us all to recite uh, from the very first moments that we all walk and talk that there is liberty and justice for all, uh, we still have a long journey ahead uh, to achieve these founding ideals and principles. And while legislation helps, uh, it will only come when hearts and minds evolve uh, and change to reflect an understanding that we have a common bond in our shared humanity as co-inhabitants of this planet uh, and as children of the creator. You know, the irony is that while our founders may have held these principal beliefs for themselves, uh, they did not apply these beliefs to my ancestors. In our own lands, my people were denied the same rights that the new nation was claiming for itself and its people. This inequality, uh, this injustice and the oppression of others' freedoms and rights in order to pursue one's own is part of our nation's origins. And despite the inspirational words reflected within our founding documents, our nation began with racism, inequality, and injustice. It is at our core. Uh, and because it has never adequately held itself accountable, it continues to struggle with these first acts of moral violation. And as we all know, uh, we are linked to our past and the roots of today's challenges are directly attributed to this past. You know, from our very beginning, uh, these truths have been intentionally suppressed to advance an incomplete and untruthful story to avoid accountability like some of the other speakers just spoke of. All the time while asking us as citizens to follow blindly without question, without challenge, as a reflection of our patriotic duty and as a reflection and promotion of American exceptionalism. Uh, there exists great efforts to instill in all of us a revisionist historical understanding that is intended to conceal the truth that we're talking about today. Uh, our great nation has fallen woefully short of its moral and ethical responsibility to hold itself accountable for its past. And over the course of our history, many people were oppressed and unnecessarily suffered and lost in the name of manifest destiny and American progress. And while it may look different today, uh, oppression is still part of who we are as a nation. And to ultimately fulfill the aspirations of our constitution, of our founding principles, uh, the time has come to interrupt and dismantle these false narratives. But in order to dismantle the structural racism and injustice in this country, uh, we must begin with our very origins as a nation. For far too long, the despicable actions perpetrated against indigenous peoples have conveniently been justified and rationalized as a necessary means to an end. Laws created by man, 
and religious do doctrine, such as the doctrine of discovery, a doctrine which viewed indigenous peoples as subhuman non-Christian heathens, were created and used to validate the immoral, inhumane, and unethical actions that are at the root of our origins as a nation. You know, as President Biden stated during his recent inauguration speech, there is truth and there are lies, uh, lies told for power and for profit. And each of us has a duty and a responsibility as citizens, as Americans, and especially as leaders, leaders who have pledged to honor our constitution, to protect our nation, to defend the truth and defeat the lies. I could not agree with that statement more, but we are at a point where we must dig deeper uh, than we have ever done so before. We are all well aware of the divisiveness that continues to plague us today, and that there are longstanding issues of racial, gender, social and economic inequality, racial profiling, extreme political partisanship, judicial injustice, and dominant society privilege. So we do find ourselves at an inflection point today with the opportunity to course correct. And make no mistake, it is an inflection point that will determine our character as we forge ahead, but it will also determine the ultimate survival of this democratic experiment. And for us as indigenous people, there is presently an opportunity to ensure that our concerns are no longer marginalized. Our refusal as a nation to be honest is at the, at the root of the systemic problems in this country. And this refusal is partly responsible for the racism and injustices we continue to experience to this day. It is long overdue for this nation to live by the principles, morals, and values it professes to embrace and exemplify. And it starts with conciliation with this land's first people and the hundreds of domestic sovereigns who predate the United States. But unfortunately, and for a variety of reasons, uh, we lack a common understanding of where we come from, and this directly interferes with our ability to forge ahead with a common cause and a common purpose. While it is important to have greater awareness, understanding, and respect for that which distinguishes us from one another, more importantly, we must find a way to focus on that which binds us in common as individuals. Individuals who are all deserving of human rights, equal opportunity, dignity, and respect. And as part of our continued evolution as a country and as a people, uh, the time has arrived for an awakening or a reawakening of consciousness. Moral indifference can no longer be tolerated. And while moral outrage may feel good, we must redirect that energy into moral courage as it is of greater value and necessity. Until we see a bit of ourselves in each other, until we share a common understanding of our journey as a nation, until we find common ground in our dreams and aspirations, we will continue to be misled and defined by our fears and our selfish interests. We will continue to turn a blind eye to the ills of our society by standing in silence. We will continue to see those not like us as others, and we will continue to justify and rationalize that which separates and divides us all. So as many have said already, uh, as we make our ch choices at this inflection point, uh, I pray that we will all choose to see ourselves as relatives who share a common humanity and a common interest in peace and prosperity. And not just for the sake of our children and grandchildren, uh, but for all our relations who have yet to reveal themselves in the generations to come. And I pray that we will finally resolve our division and move forward as a nation in greater solidarity. In doing so, uh, we will begin to move beyond the other mentality uh, that separates and divides us and replace it with the Lakota concept of Mutakaye Oyasin, meaning that we are all related. Then, and only then, will we achieve a future where the, our founding words and vision for our democratic experiment do not ring hollow. Thank you, Auntie. Kitty, that was beautiful. Um, Dr. Gil Christopher, as part of her TRHT framework, advocates for the nation to come together to create a unified vision. And just listening to you uh, saying, courage to see ourselves in each other and not to be divided by our fears speaks exactly to that vision. So thank you for that beautiful leadership, uh, incredible leadership that you're providing in the in the United Southern Eastern Tribes, but in this nation as a whole, if I may, you, you wrote an extremely point on letter to, to President-elect Biden. And I think his actions and words are echoing also your words. So thank you for the leadership you're providing. Um, our next speaker, Angela, um, Waters Austin is not able to join us today. Uh, as we know, there is a struggle to get the vaccines and we wish her well in that journey. Uh, however, I do want to recognize her as one of those living heroes and leaders in this space. So whenever you have chance to listen to Angela, please go and listen. She's just an incredible leader in this space, uh, being one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, one of the original uh, creators of even the hashtag 
BLM um, as it is and, 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 and that visual identity, but also being a local leader of the tool trace healing and transformation. She is the CEO of the One Love Global, um, currently and ongoingly working on the grassroots community level to transform this country. So Angela, we are just at awe of what everything you've done. However, fortunately, we have someone who can also speak to the truth, racial healing and transformation concept deeply uh, with us, Dr. Henderson. Uh, I've become your fan. Uh, every time we've met, there's something new I learn, and you are a living testament of somebody who has started to, to live through the principle that you have to transform yourself to be able to lead social healing and do a societal transformation. So, so Dr. Henderson, you have been looking into the in impacts of the individual historical trauma uh, and affects in society, um, but also you have looked into how you can, and you need to work, uh, build this work in, in, into the existing strengths of the communities and building on the knowledge that's there. So Dr. Henderson, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. If I can say so, um, I'm not gonna repeat a lot of what I heard, but I do wanna call out some things that Dave and Kitki said. Because uh, I think it's important to recap what we heard. Uh, Dave talked about narrative change and storytelling. He spoke about saying their names. He also talked about the re-traumatization of our pain. And he also spoke about slave laws. Kid Key spoke about the root of the systems or the systemic problem. And how we act as if we just came to a land, even if we were brought here as slaves, and now we are divided. Uh, by color, which is a made up thing, and by race. And we talk about race even in this call, Native American, African American, um, Irish, uh, my brother from Iceland, my brother from New England, England. I mean, we, we've divided ourselves and those who want wealth are just stripping us of that so that we can then argue about things that have really no value for our humanity. So I'm going to talk today very quickly about the categorical imperative. So some of you might know the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Now, I may not like Immanuel Kant as a person, but I'll talk about his philosophical approach from this categorical imperative. He starts out in his theory by saying that if we categorically believe that something is true, that at all times we should tell the truth. We should speak the truth. We should live the truth. When we start saying well, the truth only fits if. Now we're talking hypotheticals. And that's what Kid Key and Dave spoke about. This hypothetical that, oh, we, we want justice, but we only want justice for some. The hypothetical that we want an opportunity for equality, but only equality when I don't have to give up something. So what you see on the screen here is a model I developed from research I interviewed um, probably about 20 people uh, for my dissertation, nine. I've still been interviewing people. But what you see there is what we would call um, how historical trauma is shaped. Now, this model builds on the idea that mass trauma experience, then from a dominant group, leading to the subjugation of a population, impacts in five areas. Segregation, serial force displacement, physical psychological abuse, economic destruction and cultural loss. This model really looks at the policies that really undergird this idea of a categorical imperative, what I actually think is a hypothetical. The, hy the, hy the hypothesis or the hypothetical that we're gonna share a country, as Kitki said, that is built on the idea that we are all one race and we all stand together, we all family and we all win and you can work for me. And if, if I'm making money, then you share in my wealth. It's not true when you look at the policies that say you don't belong in my neighborhood, the stories, the narrative that we need to change that says move them out of my neighborhood, serial force displacement. If they don't move when I say move, beat them, psychologically abuse them, destroy their communities of wealth because we don't want to compete with them. Just the red summer, two years ago, we celebrated over 100 years ago where over 26 cities were burned down because people didn't like the wealth in these black communities. Economic destruction. How dare you try to be equal with us? You couldn't even become a certified public accountant, in which my dad is, until after the 1960s, because 
They would allow for you to get the hours. They would allow for you to get the training. They allow for you to go to school in New York. You had to go to certain schools and then no one would sign off on your paper to take the CPA exam. And then cultural loss. What do you think all of this is doing to a community of not only people, but as uh, Rachel who will speak later says, we all pay. We all pay a price. I don't care if you're black, white, purple, or green. The idea that you think that you're going to hold someone down and move forward is a fallacy. So I'm going to close on two statements. One, what Dave said. He spoke about slave laws. And if we go down to the bottom of this model, you'll see that there are lived experiences. One of the lived experiences that we have all seen up to yesterday was the Casual Killing Act. In 1669, when they first established the Casual Killing Act in Virginia, what they were trying to establish was a way that women who were beating slave children could feel not guilty. And the idea became more of a national conversation that if I am punishing a slave, if I am punishing the Native Americans who you could not enslave, if I am punishing children who you usually cannot enslave because children want to be free, what I do is I beat you to try to get you to submit to me in a physical way. If by chance I kill you, hey, I'm innocent because I was trying to correct a slave. Well, look at the 400 plus years that they've been trying to correct the slaves. They've been trying to correct Blacks. They've been trying to put Native Americans in their place. They've been trying to keep the, 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 the Latino culture out of America. They've been trying to keep the country from turning brown. They've been trying to beat us into getting a, a level of submission. And now we've divided ourselves over lines of wealth, lines of money. So how does the Casual Killing Act come full circle with this model? Well, we learned four different ways. Storytelling, direct observation, behavioral modeling, neighborhood and village condition. If you beat me and I go tell someone that I was beat, then they have now heard the story. If they see me get beat, if they see me get killed and the police officer gets off, you've just modeled a behavior. And then I go back to my neighborhood and village where I can't express my pain. And when I do express my pain, there is no true annulment or abolition as someone asked the question about in the Q&A. So abolition truly means from the Latin term to go back to nothing, which we are talking about today, dismantling. So there are many social responses and psychological responses and physical responses we feel. And I'll go back to my statement earlier about Immanuel Kant. If there is a categorical imperative that truth resides in truth, then we must all go back to what truth truly is. And truth truly is we stand together. We are all family. We are homo sapiens, which means Africans walked out of Africa. They overtook other parts of the world. And the homo neanderthal no longer exists, except for maybe 2 to 3% of your DNA. So we are all family. And when we get beyond this idea of separation, we can go back to nothing, which is what we come from. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Corey, and, and uh, you know how, how much it means to, to me to be in a family with you. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I think we will have the privilege of everybody keeping on the time, which means that we will have an incredible time to have a conversation and uh, no pressure, right? So it's so lovely to bring you as a final speaker before we go into Q&A. Um, you are doing some incredible work as a director of the Impact Peace at the Kraken Institute in San Diego about reducing the violence in the urban spaces. But you've also looked into this from what's, you know, the macro lens being involved in peace building for, for quite some time. So based on what's happening in the streets and what this nation has to face, let us know what you think, how we, we move forward on dismantling uh, the structural racism and injustice. Uh, thank you, Auntie, and thanks to everyone who has already spoken. Uh, true honor to be part of this panel. Those who know me know, know that I'm not great to keep uh, on time, <laughs> but I did actually write out and time myself so that I could do a good job of keeping to time today. So I will do my best. Uh, so let me just start by saying uh, I'm not a sociologist or a historian or an expert on race in America. 
but I do have expertise on violence, what drives different forms of violence, what can work to reduce violence, and uh, critically, the various ways that violence can be reinforced and made worse. Because of this focus, I necessarily also analyze the way that particular narratives are used to describe real or imagined threats of violence and the way in which these narratives are used to reinforce particular power structures. So by way of example, in the US, uh, black men and boys have been described throughout our history and our present as threats to white women. And this narrative has led directly to the deployment of both individual, group, and state-sanctioned violence against Black men and, and boys, as is exemplified by the brutal killing of Emmett Till. The false narratives that describe Black men as threatening and white women as victim is a created narrative. It is fostered, replicated, and intentionally integrated into state policing and our criminal justice systems. Uh, these intentionally created narratives were developed, they didn't just appear, and they were developed by white men for the purpose of reinforcing the power of white men. These narratives continue to influence our systems to this day. These narratives fester and grow in part because America remains a relatively segregated society. People's relative lack of interaction across racial lines means they're more easily manipulated than and they would be if their own personal experience aided in confronting identity-based character attacks. An education system that simplifies race in America to a story that's all about Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement is further to blame. White people with limited historical reference and limited social interaction are therefore more likely to believe language of bad neighborhoods, even language of super predators. These terms and this rhetoric, this narrative, creates the space for stop and frisk policing and other forms of abusive state-sanctioned practice. So I come to this discussion through trying to unpack how our nation's founding, its past and its present, distorts and undermines our ability to achieve collective safety. And here, I think being honest about the insidiousness of white supremacy is essential to advancing the work of reducing our abhorrently high levels of violence, which includes that today, uh, the leading cause of death for black men under 40 is homicide, which is absolutely unacceptable. I also come to this conversation as a white woman raised in an exceptionally liberal and progressive town in New England. In this very liberal town, I was simultaneously instilled with progressive values and also being told that I should stay away from the cities just south of where I lived because they were, again, bad neighborhoods. They were dangerous. They also happened to be much more racially and economically diverse than the town in which I grew up. Finally, I come to this conversation with the perspective of somebody who's worked in the peace building space around the world, including in the United States. And my experience in the peace building space is that many progressive peace builders are very comfortable speaking about root causes. And let me be clear, that is essential, but are not as comfortable speaking about what to do to bring down high rates of violence taking place today. And I'm talking about in this country in particular. I'm not quite sure why this is. Uh, I think in part it's because the conversation about violence in America, including how our institutions respond and perpetuate violence through punitive approaches, is very much about race, even as race is constructed. And perhaps that makes many progressives uncomfortable. And I think part of that discomfort is about confronting socially conditioned and reinforced structures of racism. So as Robin D'Angelo puts so well in her book, White Fragility, once the conversation starts to be about racism, a binary immediately goes up. Racist is bad, not racist is good. And if there's any chance that anything I'll be saying could be seen or perceived to be in any way racist, my brain goes on the defensive. I stop listening and I start defending. I assert my non-racist credentials without looking squarely at the way 
in which narratives, practices, and socially reinforced interactions reassert racially based power structures. So there's simply so much work, I think, that has to be done by white people in dismantling the horrific systems of right racism that white people themselves built. And this must include squarely looking at how we reinforce patterns and rhetoric that undermine actual progress. So in the last month, we saw headlines that only a pandemic could stop mass shootings. This being a reference to the perception that there had been a decline in mass shooting events since COVID-19 hit. Without being aware that in 2020, there were more than 600 mass shootings, roughly double the average of the previous five years. Most of these mass shootings involved people of color. Few of them made the news. By not seeing this violence, by not calling it out, we reinforce the rhetoric that these lives do not matter. Or we, as I have done in my past, celebrate women's suffrage and the 19th Amendment without acknowledging that women of color didn't access the right to vote until 1965 in the Voting Rights Act. So we celebrate women's achievement with the suffrage movement and, and the 19th Amendment, but we ahistorically erase women of color from that achievement being a crime of erasure. So I would assert that white people, in particular white liberals uh, who claim to be allies, have a huge amount of work to do to confront mainstream narratives and to confront the refusal to be honest, uh, Kitki, to use your words, and to confront our own safety zones. And finally, we have a lot of listening to do, and that will be deep, and it will be hard, and it will be uncomfortable, and it's absolutely essential. And so with that, I will stop. Thank you. Right, so thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. And I think that people will be asking for your written statements. So if you can share with the Alliance for Peace, building them to share with the recording, that would be a wonderful. Corey, also your framework was asked, and I think there's websites being shared, but if you can share a PDF that uh, shares that uh, what you have developed, that would be highly helpful. Now, thank you, everybody. I think we are in an exceptionally good position to have a conversation for about 40 minutes, which is quite rare in these panels that usually are filled with pre-prepared statements. This is thrilling. This is beautiful. Um, I just want to say, Rachel, recognizing that as a white man, we have to recognize that we have not done enough. We have to change and we are the problem. So speaking to everyone in this country, considering whether a true trace of healing commission is necessary, my, my words are, uh, it's not if it's necessary, but why it hasn't happened before. And it's not to the white people tell uh, if it's necessary or not. They have to humble themselves to listen and become part uh, of the change that needs to happen. Um, so I hand over to the panelists now, if you have quick reactions on each of their statements and, and, um, and, and to advance the conversation, I have a ton of questions that I'm going to put on the table and Tio and Lisa are also uh, bringing into the conversations from the uh, questions and answers. Well, Auntie, this is uh, Corey. I had a quick question or statement, actually. It's probably more of a statement. Rachel, I think, brought up a great point. Um, and, and it's something about the idea of intention. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, he's a white male. I hate talking about race like this, but um, the idea that we bucket ourselves, it's, it's problematic because we how do we tear down this structure of racism, but now race is just part of our conversation. So this white male says to me, like I had nothing to do with slavery. Um, my people didn't intend to hurt your people. I've looked into my history of my family. We came to the country after the 1850, 1860, we didn't own slaves. And I told him a story about my son who I let my friend hold my truck and he flipped it over six times. He killed his son. Uh, he went to jail for manslaughter. Uh, my son was in a coma for six days. My uh, daughter was in the hospital, broken arm, $30,000 of surgery. My son was in a hospital for three months. He hurt eight other children. When he left my home to take them swimming on Memorial Day weekend in 2010, he didn't intend to flip my truck over but he did intend to have a few drinks and to smoke marijuana. And in the process, no matter what his intention was, he still had to pay a consequence for his behavior. 
And I think that we need to stop for a moment and consider this categorical imperative, I'll keep saying that, because the categorical imperative is, I don't care what your intention was if your behavior is different than your intention. And that's where we need to stop for a moment and consider the consequences of what a system built on white supremacy looks like. Whether it was intended to create wealth or intended to make the world better for just one group of people, it has now caused irreparable, irreparable harm that over 400 years later, we're just now getting to a place where we can get convictions on murders by a police officer. I don't care what your intention is if your behavior doesn't match. And I appreciate Rachel in, in her own way saying that. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Any other uh, founding comments from the panel uh, before we move to the questions? So, Tio and Liz, do we have questions on the Q&A that could be raised and, um, and shared with the panel? Um, you know, perhaps we can go with the first question that popped up. I know that uh, Corey mentioned it in his remarks. Um, so the question is, I wonder if anyone would be willing to provide a definition or vision for abolition that may help the audience understand what that means. Um, yeah. Sorry, there was two busy dogs uh, chasing each other behind me, so there was some quarrel, but uh, uh, Corey touched this a little bit, but who else would like to speak to? So just, just so that we don't have any dead air, I'll, I'll start and then I'm going to give Dave a minute to get his, his thoughts together because he mentioned the term abolition. So I'm going to pass it to Dave. I, I, I'm going to set him up. Um, I think that abolition for me requires a new thinking around what do we do for ways to provide for our families, provide for the systems that we've created because we're printing money. I don't, I don't care what people say. Somehow we're finding a way to always do what we need to do to get by. And if at the same time, as I talk about economics, if you have a slavery system that is providing an economic infrastructure for the world, then how do you reimagine a world that doesn't lend itself to needing slavery? And it's the same conversation we're having now about how do you create a world that re-envisions justice if the justice system has always been built on? We get to pick and choose what policies define what legalities and illegalities are. And in this world, in America, it's a guilt-innocent society. And then we talk about biblical or religious. Those are honor-shame cultures, honor and shame. But we have kind of a blending of the two because you can be shamed out of your own family because you don't fit into the idea that, oh, we believe in wealth, we believe in this, we believe in that. As Rachel said, I have a lot of friends who will not come through Baltimore City, but will go to a Ravens game. Oh, I don't go to Baltimore. You know the Ravens Stadium is in Baltimore City. Well, that's different. It, it's, it's its own zip code. No, it's not. Oh, I, I'll go to an Orioles game. So you're still giving money to the city. No, it's different. You know they're crazy down in the city. They're robbing people. Every time I go to the city, there's a squeegee boy. So how do you re-envision re an idea that really restructures everything that we know the same way we did with slavery? Somebody has to abolish something and start from nothing. And we had to create systems that created economic opportunity that did not require bodies. But in the same way, if you read the book, Sick from Freedom, when they freed slaves, they, they didn't care where they went, whether they died, where they lived. They even started using terms like uh, immigrants uh, initially. And this led to the, the whole point of freedmen became the new term. But the problem began with the idea of how do you re-envision a system that doesn't consider the people? Because they just left bodies laying in the street in many communities, would not provide enough sustenance so that people could find health and wealth in communities that they were going to, to reestablish or to establish themselves. 
So now we're talking about how do we re-envision a world that is different than what we know? Imagine coming out of nothing, going to nothing. Many of us have some savings or something, or we have families and homes. These people had nothing and they re-envisioned the world. So abolition for me is to annul everything and to re-envision what it looks like for us to have some form of equality and equity that shares the resources, which means we all have to be ready to sacrifice. Dave, I tried to set you up. I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah, I, I think you did it brilliantly. Um, and and I don't I don't know if I have much more to add beyond that. Um, you know, I think that you're you're completely right that you know we're dealing with a profoundly unjust system. You know, not just unjust but violent. Like as. Um, Kitke and Rachel and Corey, as you all uh, described, you know, and I, I think that the, the reason why abolition is so important, right, is because to me, like, you know, like during slavery, when, when, you know, folks like um, Frederick Douglass, um, you know, were, were describing abolition, it was a spiritual concept. Right, it was a concept that was about addressing, you know, the the this wrong that was beyond the law, that was at the core of what it meant to be human. Um, and so, you know, in in this moment, I I think that abolition is similar. I think that abolition is about the unfinished business of ending slavery. And it um, is also about um, ending uh, the slaveholder, the police officer inside the minds of white folk, black folk, brown folk, like all of us. It is about interrupting that, that um, indoctrination, that colonial indoctrination that continues to keep us in this place where we're chasing our tails, you know, and I was, um, earlier today, I was in a radio program and um, they were talking about uh, Dr. Kenneth Clark, right? Who uh, was responding to the Kerner Commission and about like where we are again and again when is when are we going to be off of this uh this hamster wheel like uh of of internal domination of non-white communities uh by the US government and you know that that enforcement by everyday white folk and police and the external domination right of communities abroad because of, you know, the, the interest of, you know, economic exploiters here in this country and capitalists. And so the issue is connected to our economy, which is why I'm so glad that you brought it up. Like, you know, if, 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 if justice, if injustice is, is involved in the making of your paper uh, towels, then damn it, stop using those paper towels. If injustice is involved in your retirement account, then damn it, divest. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about a moral urgency and imperative that demands that the truth be told and that we abolish injustice from our government and our hearts in our minds so that people can survive, so that our children have a life, so that we're, we're not, um, we're in a profound moment. And abolition means that it is a spiritual requirement that white folk reconnect with their ancestry and heal too. That this truth healing and transformation process is not just something that we say 
as Resmo and Akum talks about in his book, My Grandmother's Hands, white bodied persons coming to this country as immigrants, they didn't come like for a good old time, they came escaping something, but instead we're giving the salve of supremacy. At least you're better than them. And that's the trauma that white folk have to get over and that we've been suffering through and we're not taking it no more. Ati, this is Kitki. If I could uh, add to the conversation uh, briefly, respond to the question about um, abolishing. So from my perspective, you know, building on my opening remarks, it's about abolishing these false narratives that we all have adopted and allowed ourselves as a society to adopt. Um, you know, when I spoke of the doctrine of discovery, when I speak to a lot of my Christian friends and relatives, they have no idea about what the doctrine of discovery is. The doctrine of discovery was a tool used by Christians to justify the illegal taking of indigenous lands and natural resources and possessions. So to act like that didn't occur is a false narrative. And it's not something that happened centuries ago. That doctrine of discovery and the way it was used as a tool in federal Indian policy is part of Supreme Court decisions in this country that are the bedrock in the way in which the United States deals with tribal nations and Indian people today. So this idea that somehow this was happened to Dr. Henderson's comment earlier, that that wasn't me, that that was something that happened so long ago, the effects of that are still very real. You know, and at the root of a lot of this is education, right? So, you know, we all went through K through 12 education and we were all taught to revere and celebrate President Lincoln. We're taught to revere and celebrate him for the Emancipation Proclamation. But what we're not taught is he was the president that was responsible for the largest mass hanging in United States history that was of Indian people. For what? For protecting their lands, for protecting their culture, for protecting their people, and for their protecting of their way of life. Yet we don't tell that. No individual is perfect, but we choose in this country to only celebrate and share the positive things that an individual does and not the full story. And therefore you end up with an incomplete story. You know, when we talk, when I hear conversations about economy, you know, the United States is the most powerful and wealthy nation the world has ever known. Part of that wealth and strength is a direct result of the lands and natural resources that it took from indigenous peoples. It derives tremendous value in return from those land and natural resources on an annual basis. So this idea that there was just this favorable exchange between the United States and tribes and trees were assigned and everything was great and it was all done above board and everybody was happy, that's the furthest thing from the truth. So today, tribal nations and tribal leaders on a yearly basis have to go before the United States Congress, basically begging the United States to fulfill and honor its promises despite it's having, it's having those possessions in its hands. And when we're asking about what that amount is, it's a fraction of a percent that we're talking about. Yet, it doesn't prioritize that honoring. It doesn't prioritize that. You know, everybody who calls the United States home, and it, and it hurts to hear it, is a beneficiary of that dispossession. They are benefiting from what was used to be Native lands. You know, and I love when I hear conversations about communal structures, right? Because that's what we were. We are. We're communal structures. Um, and federal Indian policy was intended to disrupt that. It was to carve out a new sort of reality to make us farmers, to make us individual landholders, to make us about individual wealth and prosperity rather than the success and prosperity of the whole. So I do believe 
that when we're talking about dismantling and rebuilding and what peace looks like, it's moving away from that selfish model and understanding that there is tremendous value and benefit to come together when we uh, respect and revere one another, right? When we see each other as relatives, despite whatever labels or differences that people may put on us, you know, to Corey's point, we are all relatives, we are all related, but we've lost sight of that over the years. Um, so one of the things that has to happen when, when I'm hearing comments about people who distance themselves from any responsibility to anything that goes on, those are structures and systems of privilege. And unfortunately, a lot of times people don't even recognize the very privilege that they possess. You know, and they walk through life without a full understanding of that. And then, so it becomes much easier to distance themselves from what they see as somebody else that's guilty of that responsibility. So as we're kind of thinking ahead and how we resolve some of these things to the point of my opening remarks, we have to start from the very, very beginning. And we have to disrupt what everything that we've been taught at this point. And people will label that and they will call it certain things. But that's really where we have to be as we have to press the restart button, because I don't think that there's anybody that disputes the beauty of those ideals and principles if they were actually true. Right. If we're talking about equality for all, liberty for all, freedom for all, nobody would have an issue with that. The issue is because we all know that the truth is the furthest thing from that reality. You know, and so when you hear the passion and the frustration. It's by those of us who hold, hold up and celebrate those principles, but are frustrated because we know they are not uh, parsed out in an equal sort of way. Um, so, you know, as adults, we can have these conversations, but as we all know, the way we think about things goes all the way back to our beginning when we can walk and talk and what we're told and what we're taught to believe, all those sorts of things. And until there's a fundamental change in those, things, those systems, that drive those beliefs and those values and those understandings, it's gonna be a hard road ahead. So I think there needs to be broader commitment to really um, making sure that all of us who play a role in this are doing our part to make sure that we replace ignorance with education and awareness. Then we can start talking about some real progress forward to change some of these realities that we continue to deal with. You know, I, I lived in uh, Boston for the first part of my life. Um, and for anybody who's from that part of the country, and Rachel, it sounds like you're from that part of the country. You know, it's a, I was brought up in a very liberal way. Um, this, I live now in Nashville, Tennessee. The only time I heard about the South, it was when I was in history class, and I heard about the Civil War and the divide and all those sorts of things. Well, let me tell you, it is 2021, and some of that is still relevant and prevalent today. You know, I couldn't imagine driving in a community in Boston, Massachusetts and seeing a Confederate flag flying around. Here down in this part of the country, happens every day and nobody blinks an eye about it. It says a lot. That says a lot about how much education we have left to do for somebody to understand how terribly and horrific wrong, horrifically wrong that is to do that. But they don't, you know. And I'm not generalizing a whole part of the country. I'm not, there are very well-intended good people down here as well. Um, good people doing good things. But at the same time, there is definite remnants of that history that still are here today. You know, and, and that's not even just here in the South. You know, I'm, I'm surprised, especially over the last 12, 15 years, how many stories we've seen from across this country, places that I would have never imagined stories like this of uh, uh, popping up, appearing more and more frequently. Um, the last year, the last four years, really gave a, a permission to a lot of folks to really expose their true feelings and their true colors. Um, and that's where we find ourselves now. You know, those people who have, may have been quiet before about their real beliefs and feelings about things are now being very vocal and not shying away from that. You know, and that's becoming harder and harder and it's creating this wider divide. Um, but to the point of this whole panel, as I understand in this whole effort, is despite all that, trying to find a way to forge a better path forward with the, the goal of being peace, right, and, and uh, amongst everybody. So well, you're about to make me grab my uh, blood pressure cuff, Kitki, because you got my blood boiling right now, and um, 
I, I might have to call my doctor after this and just go get a checkup because what, what he's saying is so true and so valid that I think we've taken our morals and used them as a excuse. I don't even think we know what our ethic is. I don't even think we know who we are ethically um, doing what we're doing for. And, and that's a problem because an ethic really is the moral standard by which a group of people or a group of community members or organization or family build themselves upon. If you're a church, it's an ecclesial ethic. It's what you teach inside the ecclesiology or the ecclesia inside the church and that's shared outward. When we speak about deontology, it's the, the, it's the Calvinistic idea of I have a duty. It's the, what, what is it that I do? Why do I do it? Who is telling me to do this? The command of God. If we want to talk about Martin Luther and all of the Protestant beliefs we have, the evangelicals, all of these things that we keep professing, but we don't actually follow it. How do we have in my community? I live outside of Baltimore and Harford County. I just got a license from the state of Maryland to carry a gun because of the work that I do. And I, I have to keep a card on me, but they ride around in a pickup truck with a new sign that says Trump 2020 with a zero scratched out and a four written beside it. And they have their flag next to it. And it's like, what, what is happening when we are quasi integrating and half my community is white, half my community is black. We cut each other's grass, we talk to each other. But then you have that facet that comes in and says, oh no, we can't have this. And that's the problem is that what is our ethic and moral standard by which we believe in some teleological, the end? What are we doing? What's our purpose? From a position of nature, our purpose is to have a humanity that's connected so we can support each other, feed each other, do work together, and live in a manner that I respect Kitke's area and his rights, and I respect Rachel's area and her rights, Thomas Hobbes', Thomas Hobbes fear that someone would come in and rape his family, give all the power over to the government. John Locke said, have you lost your mind? When we give power over to the government, look what happened in France. We got to cut people's heads off to get our power back. And then if we were to run up to the Capitol on January 6th, our heads would be rolling. But then we hear about, oh, no, they just sprayed bear spray. You know, they were just basically celebrating. It's this idea of the double standard that says, what is truly our ethic? That as my neighbor, I can't come to you and say, hey, man, let's have a conversation. You riding around with that flag. What is that, what's that about? It, it's the idea that we cannot be honest with one another. We cannot talk to one another. We don't even know why we're here, what our purpose is. All of this work that we do to build and provide, make money and subjugate other people is pointless if another generation is going to come behind us and do the same thing. How do we get back to a place where we dismantle separation and we really try to figure out what it truly means to get back to a humanity that respects integration? Well, I believe that it starts with a narrative change. If I tell a story about auntie's family for 10 years, when my kids get older, they ain't going to want to hang with his children. They're not going to like his wife. They're going to hate them. So imagine telling a story for 400 years, 300 years, 200 years. Over a period of time, that story becomes ingratiated and ingrained in who we are and how we think. We talk about each other like dogs. We talk about African nations who are babies in this game. They don't have retirement systems. So once you get in power, I'm holding on to my power for 30, 40 years because all I'm doing is go back to poverty. How do we, as each of us doing global work, understand the people and the structures that we're going to help if we truly want to be a help and help them guide their own level of freedom, abolition, and understanding and power? Because this idea of coming in to tell people what they should do and should not do, it's led to what Kitki has described. Oh, no, we, we're really not here to do a, a deep level of understanding. We're here to figure out what we can get from you, how we can take what you have, create chaos, which is what many of the civil wars in other parts of the world are about, so we can then come in and take your resources. We, we keep repeating the same thing. So what is truly our ethic and our moral standard that we live by if we, again, categorical imperative or hypothetical imperative, if we only use it when it fits our hypothetical, but we don't categorically do it all the time. Either we're about doing this thing of justice and this thing of 
Uh, we hold out, we hold these truths to be self-evident. If we're truly about that, we do need to go back because most of us sitting at this table and most of us on this line, we, we got a lot of Kit Key. We got a lot of, uh, uh, of, of Kanye West. We got a lot of uh, Taylor Swift. All our blood is mixed together. But because of the way the sun hits our skin, we decide who deserves to be loved and who doesn't. Instead of trying to find the perfect person to love, we should be perfect in our boundless love. And that will truly dismantle all of this. That's so powerful, Corey. Um, Tio, I think you have tried to cut across some of the questions and I know uh, there's really brilliant questions. So f feel free to put them, I, I think a couple of them on the table at least at the same time. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Auntie. There's you know, one question that, that came early on that um, asked about the linkages between um, fighting for disability rights and racism, but I'm wondering if, if if any of our speakers can kind of expand on that and, and talk. I mean, I, I, some of this has come out and really thinking about the intersections between the, you know, between the injustices of whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, um, economic inequality um, and, and comment on the intersections. And then, and then particularly there's one really intriguing question that I think uh, might be helpful for our audience is uh, to Auntie and Rachel, if I may put the two of you on the spot, in terms of organizations that are organizations that are, you know, um, traditionally white organizations that are working, that are really involved in the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, um, and, and working, and, and the burden that's put on people of color in some of those organizations. Are there ways in which the two of you can kind of unpack that a little bit and see, you know, are there ways forward uh, in the, within, within the organizations and the organizational work that needs to happen to dismantle racism? Um, yeah. Thank you, Theo. Uh, I'd love to say something about it if that's the right moment. Yeah, so um, it, it's a beautiful question. And I think uh, the honesty and the truth that, that has to be spoken has to be in detail spoken like uh, what Kit Kiyu spoke about um, was, I think, evident in the Standing Rock uh, demonstrations that you had churches that said that they're standing with, but at the same time, they were fighting in court against providing indigenous peoples to lands, even their sacred lands. And, and so the honesty that Rachel spoke about, the progressive, really has to continue. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and there's huge challenges on this. What, what I, I feel is kind of the example I'm looking into is my brother and friend, uh, Father Michael Lapsley in South Africa. He, he went to South Africa as a missionary. Um, he didn't understand the situation. He didn't know the problems. But when he went there, he realized that I am part of the problem. And, and being a white man, I have certain responsibility to, to work to dismantle the system. And he said he did this to regain his humanity. So recognizing what has happened, what the consequences are for a white man to regain my humanity, I have to join the struggle. But then I think where I need your wisdom and guidance is that to rejoin my struggle, I should not just be excluded the way I look, but through my actions and partnership and commitment, be allowed be be rejoining that human family where we're not discrediting each other, as Corey said, how sun is reflecting, but as embracing us in a space of, of love. And I think this, the beauty of Gail Christopher's model is that that there's just so far you can pressure somebody uh, to enforcement. There, the bigger changes come when there is internal change happening and a will to live through those changes in a truthful way. That's exactly in the core of dismantling uh, systemic. Uh, racism, there has to be the will to implement and hold those changes. Otherwise, the harm will come, up, come back in different forms. Um, so I'll come in on this question as well. And uh, let me start by saying, I don't think that there's any one answer to that, to this question. Um, I do think that asking the question and continuing to interrogate what is needed to be done is going to be an ongoing process, right? I, I do think there is something about Americans 
uh, in particular, where we um, we really like hero worship in this country, which simplifies and is part of the problem here is that there's an oversimplification um, of highly complex. We also like silver bullets, right? We also like one clear answer to highly complex problem sets. And there is no one simple answer. Um, to me, I think that um, there's, there's multiple things that we as, um, if I'm answering the question of what would it take to have white people take responsibility here for dismantling uh, white supremacy and structural racism, use your privilege, use your voice, use your capital. So this point about what we spend our money on if your paper towels are made through exploitative and harmful and abusive and potentially lethal practices, don't buy those paper towels. I talk to people all the time who espouse really progressive views, but they their purchasing behavior does not match their espoused ethics and morals. So use your capital, use your vote, right? Educate yourself about what you're voting for. So support legislation and not just at the national level, but the, the amount of um, uh, reforms that have been passed at city council and, and other levels in the past year on policing is woefully insufficient, but it is happening, right? So there's a lot that is moving at the city at the local level. Um, use your behavior, right? This sort of how are we interacting with individuals with one another are we demonstrating that sort of, again, ethos of a common humanity or are we not? Who are we checking in with? Who are we, you know, these sort of, they seem relatively simple, but if what we're talking about is the sort of tearing down and building back up, it is everything. Um, and, and so we need to sort of realize that and appreciate it. And then I would say use our brains, right? There's so many resources out there. There's so much. If you're not a reader, listen to podcasts. If you don't like podcasts, the plethora of sort of documentaries that are available that you could watch, there is the, the resources out there are immense once you start sort of peeling away at it. And so I think um, the, the responsibility is on all of us to get educated at every opportunity that we can. Um, and you know, that that's the hard stuff. That's the hard work because there are ugly truths here that are, I remember my um, history textbook from high school and some of the drawings depicting um, some of the key moments in our nation's history that made it look like there was a, a whole lot of friendly interaction between, for example, Native and Indigenous peoples and those who colonized uh, and abused and killed. I remember those images very starkly, and I think other people do too. And we have to confront that, right? We have to confront that what we learned as children is not fact. And we need to um, not just do that individually, but once we confront that, then we have to demand that we have new textbooks. We have to demand that our education system actually is educating and not replicating false narratives. Um, and that is something that we don't spend enough attention on. So um, I'll leave it there, but I just, I think it's, uh, there's no one thing and, and there's no roadmap that's the same for everyone. Not everyone is comfortable being an activist, but there's a whole lot of other things that you can do. Um, and so find your space that works for you, but do something uh, and do it with intentionality. Rachel, just to respond to uh, that comment that you made about uh, depictions in your history books in school. Um, unfortunately, that's not where they stop. You know, one doesn't have to go any further than our U.S. Capitol and walk the halls of Congress. And it's littered with that false narrative. Um, and it's not just DC, it's, it's in this, across this country. Uh, but I wanna just, I wanna point out one thing that is a, a little bit more, uh, going back to the point of needing to dig deeper than maybe we ever have before. Um, there is the simpler part of this conversation 
uh, which often takes form as a black white conversation. There are other layers to this conversation that need to be accounted for as well. And let me just give you a one quick example of that. Uh, I was doing a presentation one time and speaking of pictures, there was a um, uh, animation cartoon that, that's available that shows, <clears throat> well, you're all familiar with uh, native mascots, Cleveland Indians, uh, the Washington football team, et cetera. And I put those pictures up on a slide in a, in a presentation one time to gauge what the reaction was. And there was no reaction. This was a room probably about 250, 300 people. Nobody was bothered by those depictions that they see with great frequency. I put up the, uh, a different cartoon that take that plays on that same idea uh, using like the Cleveland Indian mascot with the smiling Indian with the big teeth and the feather in the back of his head. But in this cartoon, it takes the form of an Asian, of a Mexican, and of an African American. There was outrage in that room that how dare I put up that picture that's so problematic. And my challenge back to that audience is if that's problematic for you, why was it not problematic for you in the previous slide when it was depicting the Cleveland Indian? It's because we're so desensitized to it. You know, so when we talk about the Washington football team and, and the change that, that happened last year with that, that was a decade long fight to achieve that change. But Indian country as invisible and marginalized as we are usually made to be, was never heard. It was because of what happened last year with the reckoning that was going on in this country that we finally got some attention and to the point that David was making until corporate interests spoke up, Dave Snyder, Dan Snyder, the owner of the team, refused because he continued to argue that it was honoring and respecting Native people. And the only thing I would say in response that when you're thinking about needing to dig deeper into these issues, I respectfully challenge everybody to think about who's filling those seats at those football games, not just white Americans. There are plenty of people proudly wearing their Washington football gear that is a mascot that is racist, that is disrespectful, that stereotypes, and that perpetuates the problems that indigenous peoples continue to face in this country. So there are, there are many deeper layers for us to examine as we have this conversation about racism in this country. Theo, I think we're at the hour now. Uh, there is a list of beautiful questions and I believe the Alliance for Peace Building will capture these questions and guiding this conversation series further. Um, I just want to thank you all. Uh, I think um, this was a moment of deep truth, also recognizing the incredible work that is being done. And I must say that at times, as someone who comes from outside, I wake up in the middle of the night wondering whether this is ever going to be possible. But when I remember you and the work you do, I realized that every day that's happening, every day acts are done that are healing this nation and moving it beyond. So thank you for everything you've done and the work you do. And, um, and, and so thank you also for the work you have shared today. Back to you, Tio, for uh, the closing remarks. Auntie, thank you very much. And, and thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you. This has been a fantastic discussion. My, you know, at least my hope for the Alliance for peace building and for the and for the peace building community is that this the the conversation and the event that we had today it wouldn't just be this one off event, but that it really fits into uh, this broader focus of preventing uh, violence and building a holistic peace here in the United States. So, so with our panelists, I hope that this is a conversation that we can continue and partner. Uh, with all of you. Um, we are at time, I, as I said, this uh, event today is, in, as part of, is part of a series of events uh, that the Alliance for Peace Building, along with the U.S. Uh, Peace, Justice, and Democracy Working Group, is holding next week on next Wednesday, April 28th, is our third event in the series. Um, it's going to be happening at a slightly different time at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time uh, rather than 2 p.m. And the topic is going to be preventing violent extremism uh, in the United States. So I hope that uh, many of you can join us for that conversation uh, and be part of that really important discussion. Um, 
thank you everyone have a good rest of your day and and blessings to all of you uh bye bye